the EU Parliament Foreign Affairs Committee passed a landmark report supporting stronger ties with Taiwan. Stash Butler spoke with Swedish MEP Charlie Vamers about why the EU wants to upgrade its ties with Taiwan. And I speak with German MEP Reinhard Bütikofer, who heads the European Parliament's relations with China, on how EU relations with China are changing. Finally, in today's show, an update on two Delta variant clusters in Taiwan. And I'll tell you why it's hard to be a Taiwanese celebrity. This is Taiwan Insider. has been good to Taiwan lately. Poland, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and Lithuania all have been donating vaccines to Taiwan. A cute name for this was just coined by Taiwan Digital Diplomacy Association, a dumpling alliance. Lithuania has stood up for Taiwan by allowing us to set up an office called the Taiwanese Representative Office, despite sanctions from Beijing. And many EU countries are backing Lithuania's resistance to Chinese pressure. For the first time, the EU Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee also just passed a report calling for stronger relations with Taiwan, including a potential bilateral investment agreement and showing grave concern for Chinese aggression against Taiwan. We spoke with two members of European Parliament about this landmark report. First, Stash Butler spoke with Swedish MEP Charlie Wiemers, who authored the report. What does this report mean for the future of EU-Taiwan ties and what are its prospects of passing the European Parliament in the coming weeks? Well, the report is a uh, forward-looking document that states the opinion of the overwhelming majority of the EU Parliament and uh, which can serve as uh, the building stone for future bilateral EU-Taiwan relations. It sets out a uh, clear message to the Commission and the uh, European External Action Service, as well as the member states, to withstand Chinese pressure and stand for cooperation with Taiwan, which is our like-minded democratic partner in the uh, Indo-Pacific. Um, I, um, I think that um, the report will receive overwhelming cross-party support in plenary and therefore pass with a very large majority. Why is the EU seeking closer cooperation with Taiwan at this moment in time? Right now, we see uh, a rise of Chinese belligerence, disinformation, and hostility against the West. And many of the like-minded democratic partners around the world, such as the EU, the US, Japan, South Korea, India, and Australia, have come to realize the urgent need to cooperate together in confronting the increasingly overt Chinese bullying. Um, and given Taiwan's own difficult relationship with ma- mainland China, including uh, continuous uh, Chinese belligerence against the island, Taiwan can serve as a very important example of how to withstand Chinese pressure, belligerence, and disinformation campaigns in both uh, the Chinese uh, speaking world as well as uh, in the English speaking world while standing strong on on values such as freedom, democracy, and and human dignity. And uh, also, um, Taiwan has a very advanced, robust economy. It's an economy that holds a very strong position in the world economy, and it encapsulates the prototype for modernization, digitalization, and economic growth. I mean, not to forget that uh, Taiwan has become a major player in the production of of, uh, semiconductors, uh, leading edge chips. So in its very own right, uh, Taiwan is uh, a, an important economic partner for the European Union. Now, your report calls for increased official exchanges between the EU and Taiwan. What form do you see those exchanges taking? Well, historically, the EU and many member states have been uh, very careful to avoid any high level exchanges with Taiwanese officials because of Chinese pressure. And my report fully disagrees with that. It believes that European leaders uh, need to meet with uh, their Taiwanese counterparts publicly and openly. We need to have meetings between our heads of states, our foreign ministers, 
as well as secretary generals and director generals of our various ministry and ministries and departments in member states as well as uh, in uh, the European institutions. And in terms of bringing, uh, you know, ties and relations perhaps onto a more sort of level and higher level footing, um, your report also recommends changing the name of the European Economic and Trade Office, which is the current name of the EU representative office in uh, Taiwan, to the European Union office in Taiwan. What would be the significance of this move? Uh, the current name suggests that our relations are solely economic. And I think we need to move away from that. The EU, its member states in Taiwan, share much more than just economic interests. We are like-minded, democratic allies, and that needs to be reflected in all levels of cooperation, including the name change of the EU's office in Taiwan. Now, your report also expresses concern over China's aggression towards Taiwan. How can the EU help to maintain peace in the Taiwan Strait? The EU needs to continue to work with its like-minded democratic allies in the region and around the world, including the United States, Australia, India, Japan, South Korea, to confront this increased Chinese belligerence uh, and uh, also economic blackmail, which uh, really puts a strain on, on the independence of, of the foreign policy of many a small country throughout the world. I very much support increased NATO cooperation vis-a-vis -vis China as well. Um, we need to cooperate not only diplomatically, but also militarily against this common threat. The need to increase trade with Taiwan, as well as other countries in the region, would be an important signal to China as well. Uh, honestly, the West needs to wake up and smell the coffee, needs to divest from China, urgently expand trade with its other partners in the region. I know it's hard, and Taiwan can testify that that's hard, but only that way the West would signal that we will not kowtow, that we won't tolerate Chinese belligerence in the region and beyond. The report signals that the EU's relationship with China is changing. Now, I spoke with German MEP Reinhard Bietikofer, who is the chair of the EU Parliament's Delegation for Relations with China. Bietikofer has been outspoken on human rights abuses in China, so much so that Chinese state media said he's number one on the list of sanctioned officials, which means he can't travel to China. I asked him how EU relations with China are changing. This is an expression of the, the um, very determined and principled stance that the European Parliament has been taking uh, on China issues um, in recent years. We have voiced very strong, clear criticism of China's uh, atrocious human rights uh, record in Xinjiang or uh, Tibet. And we do believe that the turn of the Beijing regime towards more oppressive policies inside China and more aggressive policies in their external relations must be met with uh, a clear dedication of democratic nations to stand up for the values uh, that we all cherish and to defend our interests. And in that regard, uh, we also believe that democratic Taiwan uh, should be considered a partner. You know, you've been very vocal against human rights abuses by China and uh, China's Global Times even said that you're the number one official on their sanction list. <laughs> How do you feel about that, that honor? <laughs> Disregard my, my personality and just look at my function. I'm the chair of the China delegation. So I am um, supposed to be the prime interlocutor from the European Parliament with Chinese side. If they sanction me uh, because I stand up for human rights, the, the message is very clear. And, and that's 
also the message from the other sanctions. We're willing to have dialogue if you're willing to forego criticism of human rights violations. This is not the rules uh, of a, a fair relationship. China is trying to impose their own political um, will as a precondition for dialogue, and, and that is not acceptable. And uh, I believe that they badly miscalculated. They probably thought that uh, uh, European Parliament would cave in. The opposite has happened, and uh, now they're um, they're in a in an awkward uh, position, uh, trying to be a bully, and um, the bluff has been called. And I remember you had a tweet um, when you were put on that sanction list that you could always visit Taiwan. <laughs> would you like to visit yeah, Taiwan that, soon? That, <laughs> <laughs> that became a very popular tweet, uh, but unfortunately, under the pandemic management um, regulation, <laughs> uh, the tweet isn't even true uh, at the moment. <laughs> so I, I think it would be very hard to to visit Taiwan at the moment. But as soon as um, um, that becomes uh, more feasible again, I, I'm certainly willing to to pay another visit. The full interviews will be up on YouTube and Facebook. Next up, Stash Butler tells us more about Poland's generous vaccine donations to Taiwan. Poland became the fourth European country to donate COVID-19 vaccines to Taiwan after 400,000 AstraZeneca doses arrived in Taiwan on Sunday. I spoke to Marcin Jezewski, a research fellow at Taiwan Next Gen Foundation, to get the full picture. Why has Poland decided to help Taiwan in this particular way at this particular moment? I would like to emphasize that medical cooperation between Taiwan and Poland, and specifically Taiwan's support for Polish medical institutions, precedes the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Taiwanese representatives have generously donated equipment to neonatal intensive care units and other hospital wards, even, even, uh, even more notably, Taiwan generously supported the Central Veterans Hospital in Lodz and specifically the cardiology ward in that uh, university hospital. Specifically within the context of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we should bear in mind that Poland received a very big share of what Taiwan decided to donate to the European Union member states. Out of uh, approximately 7 million uh, medical masks that went to the EU, Poland received as many as 1 million on top of uh, 25,000 pieces of other PPE. Therefore, um, it is, it is uh, understandable that Poland, in, bearing in mind the importance of its relationship with Taiwan, wanted to reciprocate these uh, continued sustained gestures of goodwill. How does Poland's response, you know, differ from those of its of its Central European neighbours? I mean, we took, we've seen donations from Lithuania and Slovakia, and on, of course the uh, the much covered news of Lithuania's decision to open a representative office in Taiwan. How is Poland's approach to the to ties between, uh, well, to balancing its relationship between China and Taiwan different to those of its neighbours? The uniqueness of uh, Poland's approach lies in the fact that, it, that Warsaw has been able to simultaneously uh, maintain a positive momentum in developing its ties with Beijing and with Taipei. This, this dual trajectory is something that we have not seen in other Central Eastern European countries. In Slovakia, in Czechia, in Lithuania, we are seeing that political elites uh, at different levels of governance are becoming increasingly more assertive when it comes to speaking uh, speaking out against uh, China's human rights violations, as well as their own domestic disenchantment with the unsatisfactory level of um, economic and other engagement with China. I believe that when it comes to the future trajectory of Poland-Taiwan relations, uh, we can expect a generally upwards trajectory, albeit within strict bounds of uh, adherence to the One China policy. The Polish foreign minister, Zbigniew Rao, has just concluded an official visit to Lithuania. And during one of the press conferences, Minister Rao stated explicitly that uh, Poland's stance was clear, that Poland adhered to One China principle, and that uh, he believed Taiwan was a part of China. So 
despite these positive developments between Warsaw and Taipei, we should acknowledge that this might not be the right time to expect a major policy shift in Warsaw uh, vis-a-vis China, or even um, we shouldn't expect more assertiveness in speaking up uh, against China. You can catch the full interview on our social media channels. Next up, Leslie brings you the latest news with Taiwan's Delta clusters. Taiwan has so far done a great job of containing a COVID-19 outbreak that began in mid-May. Just take a look at this graph. You'll see that cases have taken a steep decline and over the past week, local cases have stayed in the single digits. But now people are concerned about two different chains of infection and they both involve the highly transmissible Delta variant. Two EVA Airways pilots tested positive for COVID last Friday, and although the two pilots are considered to be imported cases, one of the pilots then gave the disease to his son, who's in high school. The son's school shut down for two weeks, and about 500 people are in quarantine in relation to that case. Next, on Sunday, a kindergarten teacher was confirmed with COVID-19, and now a total of 27 cases are connected to that cluster. Now, health authorities have confirmed that these two clusters involve the Delta variant, but genomic sequencing tells us that they're from two different sources. We'll be keeping an eye on this story for you and be bringing you the latest updates as they happen. Next up, Leslie Lau explains why it can be tough to be a Taiwanese celebrity and hashtag Taiwan. Let's talk about Taiwan and China. I know, we've done it before, but there is a lot of stuff to cover. Previously, I talked about things like the shared history and why China claims Taiwan as part of its territory. And because of the reasons I spoke about in that video, Taiwan and China share a similar culture. Both countries speak Mandarin Chinese, which means whatever goes on over there translates linguistically over here. This affects the entertainment industry mostly because celebrities, shows, and other media can cross between the two countries with little to no added hurdles. For example, I have friends in Taiwan who watch shows or listen to music from China. On the other hand, I have a lot of Chinese friends who like to engage me in conversation about Taiwanese media. It's easy for entertainers from both sides to enter each other's markets. That's the first part of today's story. Now let's talk about the second part, which is politically sensitive rhetoric. Like I just said, China claims Taiwan as part of its territory, and that is firmly ingrained in Chinese policy. As I've pointed out many times before on hashtag Taiwan, China doesn't like it when Taiwan is referred to as a separate country. Remember, that's the reason why Taiwan had to compete as Chinese Taipei at the Olympics last month. In China, it's a lot easier for politics to influence parts of the private sector like entertainment. For example, just last week, Chinese actress Cao Wei had her online presence removed practically overnight. My point here is, Taiwanese celebrities are in a very tricky spot. On the one hand, they can transition into the Chinese entertainment market with relative ease. On the other hand, they're already kind of controversial being from Taiwan. This week's story involves Taiwanese actress Janine Chang. Chang is vastly intelligent as proven by her master's degree in industrial economics which she got from National Central University 11 years ago after she wrote a thesis. Now this is where things get a little contentious. You see, Chinese netizens found out that Chang included the words wu guo in her thesis which means my country. Keyword being country. Chang, one decade ago, called Taiwan a country in her thesis which she wrote at a Taiwanese university. University. I mean, what was she supposed to call it? My island? My controversial homeland with precarious political standing? Chinese netizens are going after Chang and there is a campaign to label her as a Taiwanese separatist. Chang has since come out to assure people that she isn't a Taiwanese separatist. But none of this stuff is new. Last month, Taiwanese celebrity D. Su lost 1 million US dollars in endorsement fees from Chinese companies after she celebrated Taiwan's wins at the Olympics. Her infringement was calling Taiwan's athletes national competitors. National competitors. Taiwanese superstar Zhou Lin Tsai was also accused of being pro-Taiwanese independence after she published pictures of Taiwan's athletes at the Olympics. Now look, this week I just want to show you how delicate of a position Taiwanese entertainers can find themselves in. Some of you might be thinking, well just don't go to China if it's that risky. But I think in this day and age with the internet, it's possible for Taiwanese entertainers to get wrapped up in this stuff without setting foot in China. 
China will come to them. And when that happens, they may have to face questions that they never wanted to answer in the first place. And before we leave you, here's a look at some of the other news stories that are on our radar. The military is gearing up for the annual Hanguang exercises, Taiwan's most important military exercises. The Air Force held a rehearsal Monday, a last-minute bit of preparation before the exercises begin on September 13th. The annual exercises involve all branches of the military and are designed to test Taiwan's ability to fight off a Chinese invasion. Nineteen Chinese warplanes entered Taiwan's southwestern air defense identification zone on Sunday. This is the fourth incursion by Chinese warplanes into the zone so far this month. Taiwan scrambled jets to monitor the intruding aircraft. Typhoon Chantu is approaching Taiwan and is expected to hit the island over the weekend. The Central Weather Bureau is expected to issue a sea warning for the typhoon between Thursday evening and Friday morning, and a land warning may follow too. And after four months of closure due to COVID-19, Elon's Qingshui Geothermal Park has reopened to visitors. Cabins equipped with hot spring baths remain closed, and barbecuing and camping are also banned as a precaution against a resurgence of COVID. But otherwise, visitors are free to wander the park's steamy grounds. Well, it's good to have you both back in the studio. Um, I suppose since the general theme of our uh, episode this week is Europe. Right, where you're from. Where I'm from, a European <laughs> indeed, or at least half a European now. Um, where would you most like to travel to in Europe? Leslie, why don't you go first? Well, this is, uh, I had a lot of choices because I haven't really ever been to Europe, and when I did, I was a little kid, so I don't remember. Oh. But one place that I do want to go is Paris. Oh, yes. And there's a story behind this, because my brother spent like a month in Paris, and he called me up one day, and he's like, yo, Paris has the best sandwiches. <laughs> and, he, and like, sandwiches are his favorite food, so like, if he's raving about them, I just have to go see how good are these sandwiches. What's what's fascinating. What sandwiches? Really? Like a, really? Yeah. I never thought just about just like any Parisian kind of sandwiches. sandwiches. Like, you walk into any French deli, and they will outdo any sandwich you've ever had the United States or anywhere else. I was like, wow, those are some big words. Wow, that's a strong sandwich game. Italy wow. is the same way. Italy's Any same sidewalk way? vendor, their sandwiches are so amazing. Oh, now I gotta go to you Italy. Gotta go both. <laughs> Natalie, what about you? Well, I really like Sweden. Ooh. I actually, the last time I went to Europe, I actually went to Sweden for a day. It was, and I felt like it wasn't enough. I want to go more. Was that I mean, in the summertime? Or it was the, the summertime. Right. I went to Stockholm and all the islands. And there's this old town from, you see buildings from like 17th century. And wow, just you saw so a lot for just beautiful. being there for a day, though. We did. But I felt like it wasn't enough. A yeah, whistle-stop so. tour of, uh, of beautiful. Stockholm. Uh, beautiful. Well, mine's, so obviously, you know, I, I'm from the UK. I, I travel to Europe quite a lot because I live geographically very close to it. So I've gone a bit more left field here. I've gone with... Croatia. Oh, Ooh. yeah. That and is a beautiful place. Have you been to I've Croatia? I've been there. It's oh, really? so beautiful. Yeah, I mean, you know, long sandy beaches, great weather. You know, you get all the kind of attractions of being on the Mediterranean, but it's somewhere I haven't been already. Um, yeah, seems like Definitely a great place it. to go. That's a great answer, man. Uh, well, that's all from us for today's episode of Taiwan Insider. I'm Stash Butler. I'm Natalie So. And I'm Leslie Liao. Make sure to follow us on our social media channels. Yes, like us on Facebook and on YouTube. Don't forget to tweet at us. Our handle is Taiwan Insider, one word. Anyway, guys, until next week, we'll see you around. Bye.